Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India going to discuss the evaluation and management of nephrotic syndrome in children. Nephrotic syndrome is a common chronic morbidity of childhood. The disease is characterized by the presence of excessive amounts of protein leakage into the urine which can be picked up by urine dipsticks as 3 plus or 4 plus proteinuria or on quantifying the urine 24 hour specimens as more than 1 gram of albumin or protein passed per meter square of body surface area in a day which results in low serum albumin, serum albumin being lower than 3.5 grams per deciliter, the presence of edema sometimes visible just as mild puffiness in severe states as gross anasaka and excessive lipid synthesis by the liver leading to hypercholesterolemia. Overall, nephrotic syndrome in childhood is a rare condition. Only about 16 to 30 per million children would be affected by this condition. But it happens to be the most common chronic non-infectious morbidity affecting the kidneys in childhood. The incidence of the disease is also rare. As you can see here, only about 1.5 or two children per 100,000 children would be affected each year by this condition. However, some studies suggest that the condition is more common in Asian children or in Arab populations. Overall, nephrotic syndrome affects boys more commonly than girls, with boys being affected one and a half to two times more often than girls. The disease is also thought to be slightly more common in South Asia. So how does nephrotic syndrome present in children? The onset of the disease is usually between 2 to 5 years of age and the parents would notice some periorbital puffiness. If left untreated, this puffiness goes on to affect other body areas, chiefly the dependent body parts like the feet. So the next swelling would appear on the feet, particularly at the end of the day. And then when left untreated, there could be massive anasarca leading to ascites and bloating of other body parts including both upper and lower limbs, groin and other areas. Typically, these children would be appearing puffy or having anasaka, but their other parameters would be essentially normal. Examination would not show any other finding. The blood pressure would be normal and further evaluation on testing would reveal the characteristics of nephrotic syndrome which include a low serum albumin passage of nephrotic range proteinuria and lipids being elevated. However, urine analysis would not reveal usually anything other than proteinuria. Some children might have gross or microscopic hematuria. Overall, the renal function tends to be preserved because this does not usually cause kidney damage and the kidney function is overall entirely preserved. However, because of low serum albumin, there are low oncotic pressure in the blood and the glomerular filtration rate would become compromised if this goes on for a while. And therefore, some children might have oliguria and some children might have elevated urea out of proportion to the creatinine levels. Most children can be evaluated and managed on the outpatient basis. However, some children might require admission to the hospital chiefly because they have severe edema that cannot be managed on the outpatient basis. Some children, in spite of severe anasarca, actually have incipient hypovolemia, which is because of a low blood volume because of leakage of, of the plasma into the interstitial space. When there are clinically overt signs of hypovolemia or the edema and hypovolemia are concomitantly present, then these children would require admission as well. These children are also predisposed to infections, particularly in the presence of gross ascites or anasaka, and these infections would require inpatient admission 
and IV antibiotic administration such as the presence of cellulitis or peritonitis. Because of the loss of coagulation factors into the urine, these children are also predisposed to thrombosis, particularly if they are hypovolemic or in the setting of a diarrheal dehydration or if there are further losses because of vomiting or other reasons such as use of diuretics. These would be other reasons for admission to the hospital. If one looks at large studies conducted several years back throughout the world, one finds that overall children with nephrotic syndrome across the world behave the same in terms of their age of onset, affected, affected, affecting principally young children, boys being more commonly affected than girls, and a low prevalence overall of microscopic or gross hematuria, and overall low prevalence of hypertension. Majority of these children would respond to a single course of corticosteroids. Majority of patients, therefore, are termed steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome. However, the disease in most children would not go away forever. It would return to occur again and again throughout childhood. The frequency of these disease activation or relapses, as we call them, is not determined. Disease relapses continue to occur over a period of many years. So, as shown in this pie chart, you can see that about 20 to 25 percent kids would just have one single episode of illness in childhood and then the disease would never return. Another one fourth of children should have one to two relapses a year, which are not that frequent, occurs for a short period of time, gets treated with corticosteroids, therapy can be stopped and then they are well again for another 6 to 12 months and then the disease might relapse infrequently again. About half the patients would have multiple relapses. These are the patients who we term as having frequent relapses or steroid dependence. These kids tend to have 4 or more relapses a year which require repeated corticosteroid administration and this continues for a period of several years as well. In a small proportion of patients, the steroids may not work at all. These are the patients who we consider as being steroid resistant and we will discuss the evaluation and management of these children separately. So all in all, nephrotic syndrome disease is a disease that begins in childhood, in early childhood, continues through childhood and usually abates by adolescence. The number of relapses is higher in earlier childhood, tends to reduce with age in most children and the disease is completely cured in most children by the time they have puberty. Studies conducted several decades back internationally as well as within our country have demonstrated that the majority of children with nephrotic syndrome do not have any significant pathology that is visible on light microscopy. This absence of any specific findings on light microscopy is termed as minimal change. So, almost three-fourths of children with steroid-sensitive nephrotic syndrome, if they were to undergo a biopsy, would show no pathology or minimal change on light microscopy. A small proportion, about 10% or so, would show focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. This term connotes the presence of sclerosis involving a part of the glomerulus termed as segmental involvement of the glomerulus in certain sections of the kidney that is focal involvement. So focal and segmental sclerosis in glomeruli is called focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. This lesion acronym being FSGS is the hallmark of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome and tends to be a more severe pathology which might progress to end stage renal disease later in life. Majority of children with nephrotic syndrome, if biopsied, would have one of these two pathologies. A small proportion of children, particularly those with nephrotic syndrome onset beyond 10 years of age, may have other lesions such as membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or membranous glomerulopathy. These are actually conditions that typically manifest in adulthood, might be associated with certain infection and tend to be associated with a more uh, proliferative or or with urinalysis showing presence of microscopic hematuria and they might have different implications in management and prognosis.
So overall in nephrotic syndrome, there is a limited role for doing kidney biopsy when the disease begins in childhood. Why does nephrotic syndrome occur? After decades of research, the precise pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome is still incompletely understood. What we do know is that histology would typically show no pathology or minimal change on light microscopy. But if one and one were to perform immune fluorescence, there would be no deposits of any kind visible on immune fluorescence either. So why does this happen? A close examination of the glomerulus under the electron microscopy actually reveals that there is a problem with the permeability across the podocyte foot processes interdigitating to form slit diaphragms. This is a section of the kidney electron microscopy revealing the podocytes which actually form along with the glomerular basement membrane and the endothelial lining the filtration surface. So we do know now that podocytes enwrap the blood vessels across the glomerular basement membrane and they interdigitate with their foot processes and between the foot processes there are these tiny slit diaphragms. If one were to look at a cross section this is what this would look like and in the presence of an intact slit diaphragm only water would filter across from the bloodstream across the glomerular basement membrane and the slit diaphragm into the Bowman space. Water along with solutes would filter out but the filtration diaphragm would ensure that larger molecules such as albumin do not go across. However, in nephrotic syndrome due to some reason this slit diaphragm intactness is disturbed. Perhaps there is a disorganization of the actin filaments in the podocyte foot processes which causes reorganization of the proteins of the slit diaphragm and therefore there is excessive permeability to even larger molecules such as albumin across the Bowman space. How and why this happens in nephrotic syndrome and why it occurs recurrently is incompletely understood. What we do know about idiopathic nephrotic syndrome of childhood is that the initial episode as well as further disease relapses might be precipitated by minor infections or vaccinations. Now infections and vaccinations are events that we know trigger immune responses and this is the reason why it seems to us that nephrotic syndrome is an immune perturbation. There are various reasons to back this hypothesis but the most common prevailing hypothesis in the pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome is that this is a soluble mediator released by perhaps the Th2, site, Th2 helper subsets of lymphocytes in response to triggering of toll-like receptors on dendritic cells by microbial antigens leading to release of this permeability factor which circulates in the blood and reaches the podocyte foot process acts through certain surface receptors on the podocyte foot processes to affect downstream pathways which signal to the actin cytoskeleton and to the slit diaphragm to result in its disorganization. So herein in this figure you can make out this, this hypothesis wherein it is said that the microbial antigens trigger toll like receptors on dendritic cells leads to induction of certain mechanisms resulting in upregulation of Th2 cells as compared to Th1 cells leading to release to of a cytokine mediator which through unknown receptors or perhaps through toll like receptors on podocyte foot processes activates downstream pathways such as CD8 T upregulation or the release of some phosphokines or through other pathways leading to disorganization of the actin cytoskeleton and disturbance of the slit diaphragm complex. Here you can make out the slit diaphragm complex. Now there are two podocyte foot processes interdigitating by means of key port proteins such as nephrin and nef1 which form a diaphragm across which filtration should not happen. Nephrin and nef1 are actually linked to other cytoskeletal proteins such as podocin, CD2AP and ZO1 which actually interact with the actin cytoskeleton. The actin cytoskeleton in turn is maintained in a stable state by certain proteins such as synaptopodin, phosphorylation of which might cause disturbance of the cytoskeleton as well.
the slit diaphragm proteins and the cytoskeleton also interact with other proteins which are linked to the glomerular basement membrane. These include integrins and laminins and therefore there are certain hypotheses that there are other soluble factors such as soluble urokinase plasminogen activation receptor which might affect these integrins, activate them and cause disruption secondarily of the actin cytoskeleton. So, as of now, there are variety of hypotheses for the pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome. The most commonly cited hypothesis in sensitive nephrotic syndrome is that of the soluble mediator released by Th2 helper lymphocytes. And these release of these cytokines is perhaps suppressed by the use of corticosteroids when we used to treat nephrotic syndrome and suppression of this soluble factor secondarily results in down regulation of whatever pathways it had activated in the cytoskeleton. On the other hand, steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome is considered to be mediated by perhaps some other non-cytokine soluble factors such as SUPAR or hemopexin or other proteases which enhance photocyte mobility perhaps through the same or other pathways and impair the, the slit diaphragm integrity in some manner. On the other hand, a proportion of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome is actually in, caused by inherited defects in the key podocyte proteins such as the slit diaphragm proteins or the cytoskeleton proteins. While we do not understand very well about the pathogenesis of nephrotic syndrome, the diagnosis of the condition is relatively simple. What you need to rely on is some key blood tests and urine analysis. The important evaluation that should lead to the diagnosis of nephrotic syndrome would be the documentation of a low level of serum albumin, a high level of serum cholesterol, normal levels of urea and creatinine. However, as we just discussed, some patients with nephrotic syndrome might have elevated urea and slightly elevated creatinine in the presence of hypovolemia. The blood counts are essentially normal. Urine analysis would essentially show proteinuria. Some patients might have microscopic hematuria as well. Any proteinuria is not nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, the proteinuria would essentially be in a heavy range. And how do you define this heavy range? We do have ways to quantify urine protein on 24 hour samples. And here on this table, you can make out what is nephrotic range proteinuria. The passage of more than 1 gram per body surface area meter square of protein in a day or passage of more than 40 milligrams per meter squares of per hour would suggest nephrotic range proteinuria. Most kids however would find it difficult and their parents would find it very cumbersome to collect the entire 24 hour outputs and for this reason we tend to rely heavily on spot urine specimens. So, the first morning urine is considered to be the most concentrated urine passed by a child in the day since he has not had anything to eat and that should show the heaviest amount of proteinuria in the urine at that time. When we check this first morning urine, we would index the excretion of protein in this urine to the amount of creatinine. This is essential to do because we need to index the volume of protein loss to a marker such as creatinine to account for the dilution of the urine. The amount of creatinine passed through the day would be overall constant, but depending on the amount of protein in uh, the amount of water intake through the day, the amount of protein intake in that spot urine specimen would vary because of the dilution of the urine. And hence, a ratio of protein to creatinine is used to look at the amount passed. A ratio of more than 2 milligram per milligram protein to creatinine is considered equivalent to passage of more than 1 gram per meter square in the 24 hour specimen. We do have simpler means of looking at urine protein however. We now have heuristics which are available and provide a semi quantitative assessment of the amount of protein passed in the urine and these are color coded albumin sticks and the upon exposure to urine for even a second the color of the stick would change from light yellow to dark green if heavy proteinuria is present and this color coding is graded from light yellow to dark green 
based on the amount of protein that is excreted in the urine. So, um, dark green or light green color would indicate 4 plus or 3 plus proteinuria which actually comes out to be about 1000 milligram per day of urine or 300 milligram per liter of urine respectively. What other evaluation is essential? Most other, most kids would require no further evaluation. We do perform the tuberculin test in our country because our country is highly endemic for tuberculosis and performance of the tuberculin test looking at a MANTU positive child, we are worried that he might be at risk of tuberculosis. Uh, we would want to cover this child well prior to starting corticosteroids and therefore we, we would initiate therapy with isoniazid in these children prior to giving corticosteroids. So a tuberculin test and a chest x-ray are sort of essential in evaluating children with nephrotic syndrome at their onset before starting corticosteroids. Other evaluations are typically not required. However, if you are suspecting other pathologies, then they would be essential. And when should you suspect other pathologies? If the child is very young at onset, younger than say 9 months old at onset of nephrotic syndrome, one is worried that this is not the typical immune mediated nephrotic syndrome of childhood. Likewise, if the child is say older than 12 years, you are more concerned about other pathologies such as membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or other conditions such as systemic lupus erythematosus which typically have onset in older children. The absence of edema is always a factor that should be considered. If proteinuria has been picked up to be in the nephrotic range and there is no edema or anasaka, this is unlikely to be typical nephrotic syndrome. Then you must think of other entities that can cause proteinuria such as Alport syndrome, such as reflux nephropathy or other proteinuric kidney disease that may present in this fashion. The presence of persistent microscopic hematuria would be very unusual in children with nephrotic syndrome. These children also looked ha have, might require a biopsy at onset of nephrotic syndrome. The presence of ra rash or arthralgia would suggest systemic lupus erythematosus or conditions such as henoxonin purpura which might have other manifestations in the kidney and these are proliferative glomerulonephritis that need to be treated differently. The presence of significant hypertension or impaired renal function also are markers that this is not typical nephrotic syndrome and these kids might require a kidney biopsy. Such children might require further evaluation with a complement C3 level, antinuclear antibodies, looking at markers such as hepatitis B surface antigen, anti-HCV and other infections. A urine culture is typically not required at the onset of nephrotic syndrome because urinary tract infections are not infections that are common in children with nephrotic syndrome. So what are the indications for a kidney biopsy at onset of nephrotic syndrome? As discussed previously, a child who is younger than 6 to 9 months at onset of nephrotic syndrome or older than 14 to 16 years at onset of nephrotic syndrome would require a biopsy. The presence of gross hematuria or persistent microscopic hematuria, presence of a low serum complement level, presence of renal failure which is not attributable to hypovolemia, suspected secondary causes such as systemic lupus erythematosus or IgA nephropathy or henoxonlin purpura and severe hypertension would be other indicators for a kidney biopsy. A child who is diagnosed to have steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome following treatment with corticosteroids definitely merits a kidney biopsy. We shall discuss the implications of this later. The, this slide indicates common definitions used in the management of nephrotic syndrome. So as discussed, nephrotic syndrome is the syndrome characterized by edema along with nephrotic range proteinuria along with hypoalbuminemia. Following treatment with corticosteroids, most children would become better and enter what we define as remission. Remission is defined as the presence of nil or trace albumin on urinary district in morning specimens for consecutively three days. On the other hand, once the urine albumin climbs back up to 3 plus or 4 plus, for three consecutive morning, day, morning specimens after the child has been in remission for a while is termed as a disease relapse. 
as discussed previously, disease relapses might occur infrequently or frequently. For purposes of management, we define a child as having frequent relapses if he is suffering from two or more relapses in any six months period or four or more relapses in one year. Patients who relapse very frequently might actually relapse even while they are undergoing corticosteroid treatment. A child who relapses repeatedly while on therapy with prednisolone on alternate days or within 14 days of discontinuing alternate day therapy is considered to have steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome which is just a severe form of frequent relapses. This slide depicts the protocols in the treatment of the first episode of nephrotic syndrome. Since the 1970s, the International Study of Kidney Diseases in Childhood Protocol of 8 weeks of prednisolone has been in use. This protocol was devised following studies which showed that shorter treatment protocols are actually associated with a high risk of the disease relapsing quickly and frequently afterwards. Therefore, the ISKDC protocol employs a protocol of administering prednisone or prednisolone orally at 2 mg per kg per day or 60 mg per meter square for a period of 4 weeks given daily, followed by therapy at 1.5 mg per kilogram or 40 mg per meter square body surface area on alternate days for 4 weeks. This protocol is associated with, disease, with remission of the disease in 90 to 95% cases. However, it is known that most children would relapse afterwards and almost half of these children would have frequent relapses afterward. Further studies indicated that perhaps a 12-week protocol is more beneficial in management of this condition than a 8-week protocol and recent guidelines recommend that treatment of the initial episode should continue for 12 weeks including therapy with daily corticosteroids at the previously mentioned doses for 6 weeks and therapy for alternate days for another 6 weeks. Fewer patients tend to relapse by 1 year of age, 1 year of therapy in this protocol as compared to the 4 plus 4 protocol and there are relapse rates are less common. People have also examined in other studies even longer treatment protocols. Recent randomized control trials indicate that longer protocols, for example, those employing treatment longing as much as 6 months of therapy are not better than therapy for 12 weeks and therefore the treatment for the first episode is maintained at 6 weeks of daily and 6 weeks of alternate day therapy and then therapy is closed. Once the disease relapses, most recommendations suggest that the therapy be restarted at 60 mg per meter square or 2 mg per kg administered daily in 2 to 3 divided doses until the child enters remission, following which therapy is made to 1.5 mg per kg or 40 mg per meter square on alternate days for another 12, 4 weeks and then therapy is discontinued. However, even shorter or longer therapy regimens have been used quite effectively. As discussed previously, a large proportion of patients tend to have frequent relapses and this is the group of patients that is the most difficult to manage. If one looks at recent studies from our center for example, we find that almost 51% of our patients have frequent relapses or steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome. Only a small proportion of patients tend to have just a single episode which is less frequent than in the ISKDC cohort and only about a third of patients would have infrequent relapses. These patients are the toughest group to manage. This is so because each relapse is associated with the risk of certain complications. The management of edema becomes essential if the child is left untreated for a while. Occurrence of frequent relapses means that corticosteroids have to be used in high doses repeatedly and this could result in cumulative toxicity because of corticosteroids. As seen in this child, you can make out his chubby chubbiness, you can make out his moon shaped body face and this is called as a cushingoid body habitus. Long term administration of corticosteroids is also associated with the risk of other toxicities such as short stature, 
eye disorders such as cataract and glaucoma and severe hypertension. Each relapse also carries with it the risk of infectious complications, vascular complications such as thrombosis and the consequences of hyperlipidemia. Further, the child has to miss school often and the, there could be psychological issues related to chronic disease. Who are the children who tend to have frequent relapses more often? Typically, the younger children tend to have frequent relapses more often. If the disease has onset earlier than 3 to 4 years of age, the child tends to have frequent relapses more often than an older child. If the initial therapy duration is short as discussed previously, the tendency to frequent relapses is higher. It is also understood that the occurrence of the first relapse earlier in the disease course is likely to be associated with a tendency to frequent relapses. Some studies indicate that boys might be predisposed to frequent relapses. A late initial remission might indicate a risk of frequent relapses. The presence of infection or hematuria at the first episode might be associated with frequent relapses. Management of these children is more challenging and might require the use of additional medications to prevent the use of repeated corticosteroid high doses. And here are some medications that we commonly use in the management of these children. The co most commonly used management strategy for children with frequent relapses is the administration of prednisolone in, on alternate days in lower doses tapered over a period of time and continued in a low dose typically at 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kil kilogram on alternate days for a period of 1 to 2 years. Such therapy is considered to prevent the occurrence of future relapses. So, in blue text you can see what our national guidelines recommend as the standard therapy. However, there are other strategies that have also have been examined with the use of alternate day steroids. While alternate day steroids administered on the long term should cut the frequency of relapses in about 40 to 60 percent of children treated this way, some children tend to relapse still while on alternate day steroids. Very often it is minor infections that precipitate these relapses. It has been shown that giving the same dose of alternate day steroid daily during infections prevents the occurrence of a subsequent relapse and that is why recent studies that have examined the strategies show that the frequency of relapse is further reduced if you make sure that the parents make the dose of alternate day steroids daily during infections for about 5 to 7 days. Another strategy that has been examined in patients with frequent relapses is the administration of prednisolone daily in a lower dose for 1 to 2 years. While there aren't many studies that have looked at this strategy, a few studies including one retrospective study and a randomized study from our center show that actually this might be more effective and safer than administering corticosteroids on alternate days with a fewer proportion of people having frequent relapses, the overall frequency of relapses being lower and actually the corticosteroid toxicity being lower despite the fact that the prednisolone was administered daily. So all in all, this is the first strategy that we use for management of patients with frequent relapses. Following the treatment of a relapse, we cut down the dose of alternate day steroids by 0.25 mg per kilogram every two weeks on alternate days and we cut it down further and further till we reach a dose of about 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg on alternate days and stay put at that dose on the long term for about 1 to 2 years. We also advise our parents to make the dose daily during infections right at the beginning of the infection such as a fever or an upper respiratory tract infection. The steroid dose is made daily for 7 days to prevent the occurrence of another relapse. So, giving daily prednisolone during minor infections if receiving alternate day prednisolone or using daily prednisolone at the lowest dose to maintain remission if alternate day therapy is not effective are measures that might be useful in managing patients with frequent relapses who are not doing very well on long term alternate day therapy.
However, children who are showing corticosteroid side effects such as growth failure, hypertension, cataract or are relaxing at a very high dose of corticosteroids on alternate day would require other corticosteroid sparing agents if you need to prevent the corticosteroid relapses. Immunomodulation with levamazole has been attempted in patients with frequent relapsing nephrotic syndrome. Used at a dose of 2 to 2.5 mg per kg, levamazole has been a useful agent in managing these patients. Levamazole originally was proposed as an anti-helminthic agent. However, it has been used with success in certain autoimmune conditions and it has been used quite successfully in patients with nephrotic syndrome over the decades of its use in Europe and Asia. Most often, however, levamazole does not achieve a lot of success in terms of being corticosteroid sparing. Most children would continue to require low doses of corticosteroid to be administered along with levamazole while on therapy with levamazole, but the dose of corticosteroid usually comes down very much and the frequency of relapses is reduced. There are not many studies that have examined this agent in a randomized fashion. However, the studies that are available show that levamazole achieves reasonable success in managing these patients. So, we tend to use levamazole as our second line therapy for patients with frequent relapses and tend to administer it at a dose of 2 to 2.5 mg per kg on alternate day with tapering of corticosteroids for a duration of 2 to 3 years. There are rare side effects that are described with the use of levamazole and for this reason, we must monitor patients carefully during therapy with this and other agents. The usual side effects that have been reported include leukopenia, rash, rarely seizures and vasculitis are also described. A useful agent in the management of patients with frequent relapses and steroid dependence is oral cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide is an alkylating agent that interrupts B cell and T cell proliferation and might achieve immunosuppression through specific, more specific pathways than does corticosteroids. Cyclophosphamide, however, is gonadotoxic and might increase the risk of malignancies. Therefore, this agent must not be used for a prolonged period of time or repeatedly. The recommendations state the use of oral cyclophosphamide at a dose of 2 to 2.5 mg per kg given daily for a period of 8 to 12 weeks. A large review of 38 studies including 1500 subjects over 40 years shows that therapy with cyclophosphamide was very successful in reducing the frequency of relapses in patients with frequent relapses but not so successful when used for patients with steroid dependence. After two years of therapy, 72% of patients with frequent relapses continued to be in remission. However, only 40% of those patients, if they had steroid dependence, were in remission. It is also noted that children who are older than 7 years tend to do better if given therapy with cyclophosphamide than do younger children. Given the significant adverse effects associated with this agent, one has to be careful when prescribing this agent. So, therapy with cyclophosphamide is prescribed if the child has failed therapy with one or two frontline agents or has significant corticosteroid toxicities and it should never be repeated in the lifetime of the patient. When prescribing cyclophosphamide, we always insist on parents looking at blood counts every two weeks or so to monitor for leukopenia which is a common side effect of therapy with cyclophosphamide. We also advise an adequate fluid intake because this child, this, this agent can cause irritation of the bladder and cystitis rarely. Chlorambucil has also been used as, an, as a steroid sparing agent in nephrotic syndrome in the past and has shown good efficacy. In fact, it has superior efficacy as compared to cyclophosphamide. But therapy with this agent is no longer recommended because of the significant toxicity, particularly the risk of seizures associated with the use of this agent. So, recommendations state that cyclophosphamide can be administered for 8 to 12 weeks to ensure not exceeding a cumulative dose of 168 mg per kilogram 
never to be administered again in the lifetime and the agent has to be started after inducing remission with corticosteroids during therapy with cyclophosphamide one would ensure a relatively high dose of of corticosteroids to ensure leukopenia doesn't happen and relapses do not happen but following completion of the course one can taper and discontinue steroids rapidly iv cyclophosphamide is perhaps as effective as oral cyclophosphamide in managing patients with frequent relapses and steroid dependence however given the route of administration being inconvenient we do not recommend it in patients with steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome unless and until the patient is likely to be very very non adherent to the therapy prescribed giving iv 3 to 4 weeks apart four or five pulses does ensure compliance since it's done in a hospital setting and therefore this would be a preferred modality if one is worried about non compliance in the families in recent years there has been a spate of studies that have examined the utility of the agent mycophenolate mofetil as an immunosuppressant and steroid sparing agent in patients with nephrotic syndrome mycophenolate mofetil typically acts on the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase pathway and suppresses the proliferation of lymphocytes and has therefore specific immunosuppressant action this agent is administered in a dose of 25 to 35 mg per kg or 600 to 1000 mg per meter square in two divided doses given daily for a period of 1 to 2 years various retrospective studies and prospective studies have confirmed that this agent is quite effective in reducing the frequency of relapses reducing the proportions with relapses and achieving steroid sparing during therapy with mmf patients who fail two or more therapy lines as described previously are patients in whom you might need to consider therapy with calcineurin inhibitors this is another group of immunosuppressive agents calcineurin inhibitors chiefly cyclosporin and tacrolimus have been used for se- for several decades in patients undergoing transplantation but more recently in the last 2 3 decades have also been used for nephrotic syndrome therapy with cyclosporin or tacrolimus is very effective in reducing relapse rates and in achieving high re- rates of sustained remission in patients with nephrotic syndrome however these are not preferred therapies because these are agents with a narrow therapeutic potential and monitoring their therapy closely becomes essential because if the therapy is left unmonitored there can be significant toxicity the chief concern with the use of calcineurin inhibitors is actually nephrotoxicity both acute and chronic nephrotoxicity is described because of the acute nephrotoxicity one has to routinely measure creatinine potassium urine output carefully in these patients soon after initiation of therapy and periodically over a period of time once we are concerned with once the therapy with calcineurin inhibitors is also associated with a high rate of tubular interstitial fibrosis on the kidneys if administered on the long term this is the reason why one is always worried prescribing calcineurin inhibitors particularly for longer than 2 to 3 years wherein it becomes almost imperative to perform a kidney biopsy after 3 years or so of therapy to look at the extent of tubular interstitial fibrosis if continued therapy is planned another agent that has been used recently in patients with difficult steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome is rituximab rituximab is a specific has a specific action it induces depletion of all b cells in the body since it causes apoptosis of b cells it being a monoclonal antibody directed against cd20 marker on b cells various studies conducted across the world have shown that administration of one or two doses is very effective in achieving steroid free and calcineurin free calcineurin inhibitor free remission over a long period of time in patients with difficult nephrotic syndrome there is a marked reduction in relapse rates and most patients can go off both corticosteroids and other immunosuppressive agents if administered one or two doses of rituximab however since the b cells are likely to repopulate after a while 
and the effect of rituximab will not be sustained. These patients might continue to sh might show disease relapses subsequently after about 9 to 24 months of being well. Redosing also has been done in various series and it has been shown that the agent is safe and effective on the on the medium term. However, since the use of this agent is associated with a high risk of reactions such as rash, fever, hypotension during administration and the risks of long-term toxicity are not known. It should be reserved only for the most difficult steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome patients. So overall this slide depicts our lines of management of patients with frequent relapses. The first strategy that we use is the use of alternate day prednisolone as described at 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg on alternate days for 12 to 18 months. Usually our second line therapy would be levamazole but in countries such as the USA where levamazole is actually not available, the second line usually would be the use of oral cyclophosphamide given in a course for 8 to 12 weeks. Other therapies such as mycophenolate mofetil have also been used simultaneously at the same rank as cyclophosphamide or levamazole or afterwards having failed levamazole and cyclophosphamide. The use of calcineurin inhibitors is reserved for patients who fail two or three lines of therapy described previously and rituximab is used for the most refractory kind of patients who have not responded or have continued to show relapses despite the use of these agents. We do, the guidelines do not recommend the use of another course of alkylating agents nor are the use of agents such as azathioprine recommended in the management of nephrotic syndrome. So this slide again shows our algorithm. You can see that patients with frequent relapses or steroid dependence, the first strategy to use would be the administration of prednisolone on the long term on alternate days. If the patient continues to show frequent relapses, one would add levamazole and try to cut down on the dose of corticosteroids. If the patient fails the strategy as well or has significant corticosteroid toxicity, one would use oral cyclophosphamide. However, we do remember that this agent can only be given once in the lifetime and older children do better. So sometimes we might skip this step and use mycophenolate mofetil instead if the child is particularly young. Mycophenolate mofetil and cyclosporin or tecrolimus are other agents that can be used if patient has failed therapy with long-term prednisolone or levamazole or cyclophosphamide. And as you see, we usually use rituximab as the last step in the management of these patients if the child is continuing to show relapses or has steroid toxicity. Cyclophosphamide, calcineurin inhibitors and rituximab are relatively potent agents that achieve more corticosteroid sparing and therefore are preferred earlier if relapses are associated with life-threatening infections or significant steroid toxicity. World over, there are various guidelines in the US, in the Indian society, from the France, and from the Kidney Diseases Improving Global Outcomes group and all these guidelines overall agree on the management of the initial episode of nephrotic syndrome as well as the management of relapse of nephrotic syndrome. Most guidelines vary in the duration of recommended duration of alternate day prednisolone on the long term to be administered for patients with frequent relapses and the order of steroid sparing agents used for frequent relapses and dependence is not determined in various guidelines because all guidelines would recommend the use of these agents but nobody knows which agent should be used before or afterwards. In the US for example, levamazole is not available at all so it does not form part of the algorithm at all and therein the options that they would have available would be cyclophosphamide, mycophenolate and cyclosporin or tecrolimus. The most important component of management of nephrotic syndrome is how we advise our parents. The most important component becomes the parent's responsibility because this is the most important part where picking up a relapse is essential because if the relapse is left untreated for a while, the patient might become hypovolemic or develop severe anasarca or have a severe infection requiring hospital administration. So, we recommend to our parents that they must test the urine by dipstick on the first morning urine specimen every day and maintain a diary at home 
which they should bring to the hospital when they visit the physician. The urine protein diary should be brought to the hospital and the medicine should also be charted on it and brought to the regular checkups because this diary is very very informative. It informs us of when the relapse happened, at what dose of corticosteroids it happened and how it was managed. The patients are advised to look at the urine protein daily and if it rises to 3 plus or 4 plus, following 3 days of 3 plus or 4 plus, they can step up the corticosteroid therapy and start relapse treatment at home and then visit the hospital at their earliest convenience to be able to, to, be, to be assessed and evaluated whether they are frequently relapsing or not and how their relapse should be managed and whether they require any measures such as long term alternative steroids or corticosteroid sparing agents to be instituted. So, the urine protein diary record is a must for management of all patients of nephrotic syndrome. The other important advice that we must remember to tell our parents is that while on corticosteroid therapy or on other immunosuppressive therapy, the patient should not receive live vaccines. The use of killed vaccines while on immunosuppressive agents is not a contraindication, but the effic efficacy of these vaccines might be compromised. Hence, if possible, the use of killed vaccines should be postponed at least till the dose of corticosteroids is lower. But live vaccines are an absolute no. This is so because these patients would be at risk of acquiring infections from the vaccine strains of the virus or bacteria themselves. Hence, we would recommend our parents that they should not give their children oral polio vaccine measles, MMR vaccine or chickenpox vaccine while the child is re receiving corticosteroids or other immunosuppressive agents. Another entity that patients need to be advised about is the occurrence of chickenpox. Chickenpox can be very severe in children who are receiving immunosuppressive agents and therefore parents must be advised to bring their children immediately to the attention of a physician if the child has any symptoms suggestive of a chickenpox rash. For the same reason, we also recommend the administration of the chickenpox vaccine to these children but as discussed just now, this vaccine cannot be administered while the child is receiving immunosuppression. We also know that children are at risk of increased risk of getting infections such as pneumococcal infections and therefore these children should be vaccinated against pneumococcus. For that reason, we would advise the administration of the conjugated pneumococcal vaccine followed two months later by the polysaccharide pneumococcal vaccine. Five years later, if the child is continuing to show disease relapses, another shot of the polysaccharide vaccine would be required. This is particularly true for any child who has been admitted with peritonitis. We know that pneumococcus is the most common strain causing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in the presence of a nephrotic syndrome relapse and therefore having had peritonitis, definitely the child is at risk of similar such events if they are not careful with the management of relapses and vaccination becomes essential. So, the management of infections in nephrotic syndrome relapses you often requires admission to the hospital if this is a serious bacterial infection such as peritonitis, cellulitis or pneumonia. Peritonitis should be suspected in any child with a relapse of nephrotic syndrome who has gross ascites and presents to you with abdominal pain which is associated with tenderness of the abdomen. Diarrhea, vomiting and fever might be present. On doing an acytic fluid aspiration, there is a cell count of more than 100 leukocytes per millimeter cube and more than 50% of it would be neutrophils. The most common causative organism is pneumococcus and this can be picked up on gram stain as well as on culture. Therapy for peritonitis would require the administration of intravenous third generation cephalosporins such as ceftriaxone or cefotaxim for a period of 7 to 10 days. Another infection that can occur in the presence of gross enasaka is cellulitis. Cellulitis is a cutaneous infection characterized by redness, induration and tenderness of the skin surface. This usually occurs over the limbs or buttocks but may occur on the trunk as well and any site of redness and pain should be inferred to be cellulitis. These children also require IV administration of antibiotics and stay in the hospital for a minimum of 5 to 7 days.
Pneumonia with gram-positive cocci is also a common infection in children with relapse of nephrotic syndrome who typically present with fever, cough, tachypnea and crepitations and requires IV third generation cephalosporins or augmented to be administered. The management of edema in patients with relapse of nephrotic syndrome requires an initial assessment of whether or not hypovolemia is present. Hypovolemia is assessed clinically as well as using biochemical parameters. A child with edema would usually not have hypovolemia unless and until he has a setting of very low food or water intake or the presence of diarrhea or vomiting or the use of diuretics. These are the children who are susceptible to hypovolemia. On clinical examination, you might find the presence of tachycardia, low blood pressure, delayed capillary refill or cold clammy extremities. These are clinical pointers to hypovolemia and re would require management with inpatient admission. These patients would require the administration of IV fluids and IV albumin to bring up the blood oncotic pressure and therefore recovery from hypovolemia. Patients who are not overtly hypovolemic can be managed with oral diuretics. The first diuretic that we would use would be furosemide. Furosemide is typically administered in a dose of 1 to 3 mg per kg per day in single or two divided doses and is very useful in the management of mild to moderate edema associated with the relapse of nephrotic syndrome. Since simultaneous treatment of pred with prednisolone is also initiated, usually children enter remission rapidly and do not require long-term administration of furosemide. After 2 to 3 days, the child is better and edema abates and you do not require long administration of furosemide. Children who are not responding, you can step up the dose of furosemide to 4 to 6 mg per kg per day and add spinonolactone typically for the need of potassium sparing because Potassium losses are excessive with the use of furosemide and aldactone or spironolactone helps conserve potassium better. Children who do not respond even to this, you might want to add other agents such as thiazide diuretics such as hydrochlorothiazide or metolazone. The doses are as shown here. Children who do not respond to a combination of 2 to 3 diuretics would require inpatient administration of IV furosemide boluses or infusions with or without IV albumin. Albumin is often very essential in these patients because these children are actually clinically hypovolemic and there isn't much to remove from the blood compartment in, by the diuretic and administration of albumin simultaneously with furosemides achieves better edema control than does the administration of furosemide alone. So, overall, nephrotic syndrome is a disease of childhood, but about 10% of children might continue to relapse into adulthood. Recent data actually suggests that this proportion is closer to 20, 25 to 40%. The children who relapse into adulthood are actually the younger ones at onset, who have a high frequency of frequent relapses in childhood and who have required use of various agents for the management of frequent relapses. So this is the overview of the management of steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome, management of edema, management of relapses, complications might occur, there is a high risk of corticosteroid toxicity and these children are at risk of corticosteroid toxicity as well as other manifestations. Another important small but small component of disease is steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Only about 10 to 15 percent of patients would have steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome but these are the most difficult to manage patients in terms of their complications of disease as well as complications of the therapy and these children are also at risk of progressing to end stage renal disease. These children have all the complications of corticosteroid toxicity that are described for patients with frequent relapses but the most important concern is preserving their renal function on the long term with the use of agents to induce remission because it is known that inducing remission will be very important, will carry very important prognostic value because children who enter remission with other agents are likely to do better on the long term than children who do not attain remission with the use of non-corticosteroid agents. So how do you define corticosteroid resistance in nephrotic syndrome? 
looking at this graph drawn based on various studies conducted several decades back, it is shown that most children who have to respond to corticosteroids would respond by 4 weeks of therapy with daily corticosteroids given in high doses. Only about 5% would respond over the subsequent 4 weeks more of therapy. So, traditionally the definition of steroid resistance has been a lack of response to corticosteroids administered at 2 mg per kg or at 60 mg per meter square given daily for a period of 4 weeks. Initial steroid resistance is the lack of remission despite treatment of initial episode for 4 weeks with persistent nephrotic range proteinuria. Late steroid resistance is a patient who attains remission after therapy of the initial episode but fails to respond during any subsequent relapse in the disease course. While these are definitions of steroid resistance, we do not precisely understand if initial steroid resistance behaves any differently from late steroid resistance. We do know, however, that a proportion of patients with initial steroid resistance are more likely to have inherited defects in podocyte proteins than are patients with late steroid resistance. And it, therefore, it is understood that perhaps patients with initial resistance might do worse than patients with late resistance. And these are the key proteins that might be impaired in steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. We know that a proportion of patients might have very early onset of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome beginning in early infancy, less than 3 months of age. These patients with congenital nephrotic syndrome as they are called might have defects in the slit diaphragm protein known as nephrin which forms the slit diaphragm between the two podocyte uh, foot processes. Then there are other proteins such as podos podosin which might have a mutation or there are other proteins such as LAM2 which has a pathological hallmark known as diffuse mesangial sclerosis. Then other proteins such as actinin, TRPC6 which is a calcium channel, CD2AP which again links the slit diaphragm to the actin cytoskeleton, WT1 which is a transcription factor. All these are genes which might be affected in inherited forms of nephrotic syndrome which usually present as either congenital nephrotic syndrome or as initial steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Definition of steroid resistance, uh, we just discuss that 4 weeks of therapy is usually sufficient to declare steroid resistance but some patients might continue to show remission in the subsequent 4 weeks as well. Therefore, recent definitions say that you must administer corticosteroids for a minimum of 4 weeks daily at an adequate dose followed by alternate day therapy for another 4 weeks before you call this patient as being steroid resistant. The essential evaluation for such patients is 1. A kidney biopsy, 2. Estimating the level of kidney function by looking at serum creatinine and 3. Measuring the absolute amount of protein that is being lost in the urine of this patient. These are essential for various reasons. The kidney biopsy is essential because histology in some ways indicates the prognosis of the condition and might dictate choices of therapy. The GFR has to be estimated because you are going to administer therapies which might be toxic to the kidneys themselves. And the urine protein excretion has to be assessed as a baseline parameter on which you shall assess the response to therapy. It is not recommended to carry out evaluation for genetic mutations routinely but a proportion of these patients are likely to carry mutations. So very often for reasons of ease we would recommend genetic mutations evaluation after they have not responded to the second line immunosuppression. Patients with steroid resistance would undergo a renal biopsy and a majority of them would show either minimal change disease or focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. Focal segmental sclerosis is as described to you previously the hallmark of steroid resistance but only about a third to one half of patients with steroid resistance would have focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. The other most common pathology that you might find is minimal change disease. It is also believed that some patients with minimal change disease might actually transition into focal segmental glomerular sclerosis and understanding this we do not tend to manage the kids with minimal change and FSGS differently when we manage steroid resistance. A small proportion of patients, typically older children, might have other pathologies such as membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis or membranous glomerulopathy which are managed differently than the idiopathic steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome.
focal segmental glomerular sclerosis has various subtypes the most common is the no not otherwise specified pathology uh, other varieties that are common are perihilar variant the the collapsing variant of fsgs is actually considered to be a separate entity now and is considered to be associated with typically a bad prognosis various therapies have been tried for patients with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome however over a period of time many of these therapies have been given upon so no longer do we use therapy with oral cyclophosphamide because the rates of remission are barely 25 to 40% similarly high doses of iv corticosteroids such as dexamethasone and methylprednisolone given repeatedly more frequently at the beginning and then over a period of weeks to months tapered in what was known as the mendoza protocol given alongside oral cyclophosphamide has been almost abandoned for use because of the high risk of corticosteroid toxicities and the risk of infections in patients with steroid resistance iv pulses of cyclophosphamide have been used for a period of 5 to 6 pulses in patients with steroid resistance the efficacy of this treatment varies between 30 to 50% but again the rates of remission are not that satisfactory what is coming up most often in therapy of steroid resistance is calcineurin inhibitors the use of calcineurin inhibitors is now considered to be the standard of care for patients with steroid resistance and we shall soon understand why other therapies that have been used such as rituximab abatacept and galactose are described chiefly in anecdotal reports the two other components of therapy of steroid resistance that are essential are the administration of prednisolone on alternate days and the use of ace inhibitors that cut down proteinuria significantly as well when administering therapy for steroid resistance one has to have certain definitions for response the response for steroid resistance is typically assessed at about 6 months of therapy with any agent and it is defined in terms of complete remission or partial remission or non response based on the criteria that are shown here complete or partial remission are important to recognize and define because it is known that survival of the kidney is strongly linked to the achievement of remission so patients with complete or partial remission tend to do very well on the long term whereas patients who do not attain remission tend to progress rapidly to end stage renal disease almost half those patients would be in end stage renal disease after 5 years of therapy so we look at remission in terms of absence of proteinuria increase in serum albumin and the lack of edema if there is no edema and the serum albumin is above 2.5 g per deciliter the child has remission remission is complete or partial based on the level of proteinuria that still remains use of calcineurin inhibitors in patients with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome is associated with a relatively high rate of complete or partial remission which is typically attained at 3 to 4 months of therapy with calcineurin inhibitors however therapy is associated with toxicity on the long term therapy cannot be administered forever but once therapy is stopped there is a risk of the disease relapsing uh nephrotoxicity is the chief concern with the use of calcineurin inhibitors and for that reason one needs to monitor renal function carefully if you look at this slide you can make out that there are stripes of interstitial fibrosis in this section of the kidney and this is this irreversible fibrosis that is the worry when one is using calcineurin inhibitors on the long term for this reason one needs to monitor renal function minimize the dose that is required and perform a renal biopsy 2 to 3 years down the line if continued use is anticipated switch to therapy with mycophenolate mofetil or rituximab is shown to help maintain remission in steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome and helps avoid toxicity and maintaining remission in patients with steroid remission rituximab is not recommended for use in steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome except as a strategy to switch from therapy with calcineurin inhibitors in patients with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome who are already in remission ace inhibitors must be used in patients with steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome uh, because they are known to reduce proteinuria to the tune of 40 to 60% on their own without using any immune mechanism the antiproteinuric effect of enalapril 
is very high and almost 50% reduction of proteinuria is noted if used at a dose of 0.6 mg per kg per day and therefore that would be standard of care to institute therapy with ACE inhibitors at the diagnosis of steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Other supportive therapies in patients with steroid resistance would require would include the administration of calcium and vitamin D because continued use of alternate day prednisolone means that there could be vitamin D deficiency and poor metabolism of vitamin D in these patients. Also, some children might require the administration of atorvastatin or other agents to maintain the lipid levels at the recommended values. So, therapy for steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome. Calcineurin inhibitors is the initial therapy. You assess the response to therapy at 6 months of therapy. If complete or partial remission is there, you continue therapy for longer, typically for 2 to 3 years. But if there is no response to therapy, stop therapy because continued therapy has toxicity. Do use ACE inhibitors or ARBs along with calcineurin inhibitors. If patients fail the therapy with calcineurin inhibitors, ideally one should do genetic testing for mutations in podocyte proteins. And one could try administering mycophenolate mofetil or high-dose corticosteroids or a combination of mycophenolate mofetil and calcineurin inhibitors to try to induce remission. But the evidence in favor of these strategies is very, very limited. A very small subgroup of patients might have congenital nephrotic syndrome beginning at less than 3 months of age. It is an uncommon entity and it is usually caused by inherited, inherited defects in podocyte proteins, rarely by maternal infections such as syphilis or CMV. These children would not respond to immunosuppression and they would require substantial care in terms of administration of albumin, need of diuretics, need of high protein diet, need of aspirin to maintain non-coagulable state and majority however would progress to end stage renal disease even in early childhood. So, the management of this condition is very difficult and the correct method of managing this is still not determined. In the West, it would be routine to perform unilateral or bilateral nephrectomy to cut down proteinuria in these children and to put these children on dialysis till they get a kidney transplant. So, these are my key messages. Steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome is, a, is the most common type of nephrotic syndrome in childhood. Only about 25 to 30 percent would have a single episode. Almost half the children would have frequent relapses of steroid dependence and would require long term care in terms of corticosteroid and non corticosteroid therapies. Risk of relapses is high and relapses might be associated with complications. Steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome accounts for 10 to 15 percent of patients with nephrotic syndrome. Histology which might show minimal change disease or focal segment and sclerosis. Underlying inherited defects might be present and the response to immunosuppression is less satisfactory. Calcineurin inhibitors are the standard of care along with ACE inhibitors and alternate day steroids. Long term outcome is less favorable, particularly in children who do not respond to calcineurin inhibitors.